Welcome everybody to this fascinating panel called the New World of Music Discovery based on some amazing consumer research done by Russ Krupnik and uh, inspired by Garrett Levin, CEO of DEMA. So I'm going to hand over to Garrett now to introduce himself and the panel. Garrett? Thanks, Richard. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk with you and Russ about this, uh, this, this really great research. Uh, I wish we were doing it in person. Um, it's still a little bit weird to do these things via Zoom, but uh, it seems like it is just over the horizon. So maybe next year we can get the, the band back together and, and, and do it uh, in person somewhere. Um, you know, today's conversation, which is about the, the new world of music discovery, is really an extension of a conversation that Richard and I have been having since uh, I started in this job a little over two years ago at DEMA. Uh, and it, frankly, it's a conversation that I think has been happening all throughout the industry. Intuitively, we've all kind of felt that one of the greatest strengths of streaming is that unlimited shelf space. You combine that with a lot of the innovative features that have really turned it into your record store, CD collection, MTV, radio station, liner notes, your really smart music friend, all into you know, one you know, uh, compelling interface. And surely streaming must be driving discovery of music more shelf space, more discovery. These ought to be things that are really great for the, the, the indie sector. And that's what we've all kind of felt. And so what we set out to do with this, with this research project is learn more about how fans actually discover music, what they value in that process. Um, we, I can't think of anybody better to kind of undertake that task than Russ, who's been kind of looking at and working with kind of consumer data through the entire evolution of the digital music space. Um, and I'm really excited to hear him walk us through these findings and then talk about it, because at this moment that we're in right now, uh, we in the, in the music industry are competing with more things than ever before on, on kind of fans' attention. And so knowing the hows and the what's of discovery is kind of more important than ever. Discovery drives everything else. And so what drives discovery? I'll end my little intro here and turn it over to Russ, who actually has the, the, the more compelling stuff than, than me, uh, with a note on a, a somewhat overused phrase in this space, which is about democratization of music. We could have an entire week-long conference on that topic, unpacking it, repacking it, coming up with new ways to talk about it. We still wouldn't run out of things to talk about. But I really do believe that this research that we're about to talk about re represents a vital and concrete example of what that means at its core, which is that streaming is unlocking new discovery, powering ongoing engagement across the industry, and doing so in ways, doing so in ways that weren't previously possible. And I, I'm fascinated to see where this goes. We've got a lot to unpack, a lot to cover. I'll turn it over to you, Russ, to, to walk us through some of, the, some of what, what we found. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. Great. Thanks you, thank you, Garrett. Um, as Garrett mentioned, um, I'm Russ Krupnik from Music Watch. I'm the managing partner. Um, I've been involved with consumer insights and research in the music industry for over 20 years, and, and actually in the, in the realm of music discovery, um, this is the fourth major study that Music Watch has conducted on um, music discovery dating back to the mid 2000s. So it's really fascinating for me to watch how we evolved from this radio to retail model um, that was true, holding true for generations to kind of the new models of music discovery. So. What I'm gonna do is, over the next couple of minutes is share a few of the high level insights with you. Um, this was a study that we just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. The field work was done in May. Uh, we surveyed a thousand music listeners who were interested in music discovery within the US. And um, let me take you through just a couple of high level uh, findings and then we'll kick it back to our panel. I think when it comes to music discovery, for me, one of the interesting things is, you know, we inside the industry tend to think about music industry as being entirely new music from entirely new artists that fans have spent hours and hours and hours to uncover. And I think when you unpack fan behavior, one thing to really keep in mind is that 
there's a portion of the fan base who's really fascinated by new music. There's another portion of the fan base who really just wants to hear catalog. I know we, we tend to overuse that term soundtrack of, of our lives, but they're really interested in hearing things that their prom song, their wedding song, their first love song. Um, so it's a lot about, for many of them, it's a lot about catalog. Um, for some, it is about finding the latest, greatest new artist. But for many, it's about finding a familiar artist that they know and love. And for some, music discovery is a very active uh, hobby of theirs. For some, they're just happy being passive and having those songs fed to them. So let me start out by sharing some of the, the findings in terms of how people go about music discovery. If we start at the, the top bar over on the left, you can see that about 26% say that they spend a lot of time seeking out new music, songs, artists they've not heard before. But almost half, 49% over on the right, say they don't really have a whole lot of interest in hearing new songs or learning about new artists. They're just totally satisfied with hearing songs from their favorite artists. And about half, just moving down, about half prefer to listen to the latest and newest music from today. And almost the same amount prefer to listen to music from years ago that they already know and are passionate about. And then when you take a look at artists, just again, moving down a little bit, when it comes to music discovery, about a third prefer hearing new music from up and coming artists. And about half wanna hear new songs from their favorite artists. And finally, just at the bottom bar, about a quarter of folks said that they're actually leaning in and frequently searching for new music, while over 40% said they're just absolutely happy hearing new songs if they happen to come up while they're listening. So I think that this really speaks to the diversity of music discovery habits when it comes to songs, when it comes to artists, and when it comes to how fans actually go about the music discovery process. Really interesting, and this is something that certainly over the course of the studies that we've done has changed an awful lot. Scroll down here, is how we go about finding new music. We ask consumers to tell us all of the sources that they find helpful for hearing or learning about new songs or for rediscovery songs. And if you take a look at the top, 63% said it's on a music streaming service. Years ago, radio used to really be at the top of that list. Now radio is second um, at 52%. But look down at number three, which is social media or dance video apps. So you can see the impact that social media has and dance app like TikTok, have, dance uh, apps like TikTok have had on the music discovery process over the past couple of years. What I find really interesting when I look at this chart, and I know there are a lot of numbers here, is take a look at all of the different ways that consumers are relying on in terms of finding or discovering new music. Besides streaming services, which you know clearly have become the, the primary way that we discover music. Take a look at things like podcasts right in the middle. 26% said that they were relying on podcasts. Music shows, we've always known those as being influential. So music competition shows at 23%. Award shows like the Grammys or the VMAs at 21%. And even kind of the, the newest format in a sense, live streams down at 16%. So for me, the the really big takeaway is that all of these sources where music get played are really helpful for fans to discover music. But we asked them, now thinking about all of those different sources, which is the one that's actually the most, pick the most influential, and you can see how much the landscape of music discovery has changed over the last few years. Far and away streaming service at the top in terms of most influential. If we take a look at new music, uh, favorite streaming service was selected by 30%. 
AM FM radio by 11%, social media by nine, and friends or family word of mouth essentially by 8%. So, so you could see how much over the past couple of years streaming has come to dominate the landscape of music discovery. Music discovery in and of itself is important, but I think what's equally important is what happens next. What does the music fan do after they find new music or after they find a new artist or after they rediscover some music from um, their past catalog? If you take a look at the top bar, you can see that about 61% said that they listened to the song or artist again. So music discovery in a sense isn't static. There's this kind of virtuous cycle that's going on. I hear the song and then I'm going to listen to the song all over again. Where's that happening? About 42% said on an audio streaming service, a third on a music video service and 21% on social media. Now, a distant number two is that since hearing that song, a lot of folks are doing research on that song or artist. About 20% said that they did some kind of research. And you can see they're looking for the video, they're looking for the name of song, the artist name, lyrics, personal information. And I think what's really wonderful is that a lot of them are going and seeking other music from that same artist. For me, this really emphasizes the importance of, I'll call this kind of the artist metadata um, in the discovery game, but the importance of being able, of allowing fans to be able to find out more information about you as the artist um, and to create that kind of bond beyond just the song itself. If we take a look at, and this is just for uh, features on streaming services, which features are being relied on most? I'm actually interested in, uh, uh, most interesting to me was the first bar and the third bar. 44% um, said they rely on similar songs or vid videos automatically being played for you. Um, down at the third bar, about an equal amount, 43% said recommendations for similar music or videos shown alongside or below songs or videos as you play them. To me, um, what this really points out is how effectively streaming services are becoming the DJs, what DJs were to us a generation ago, streaming services are now filling out that same role um, and doing it very effectively in terms of saying, here's something that you've either chosen in your playlist or something that we know that you like and play often. Um, but now we're going to give you music that is similar. And what fans are saying is that that's a very effective way for them to discover or rediscover music. And you can see some of the other features are also very important as well, whether it's personalized playlists, um, whether it's the ability to type in keywords and then get some recommendations back or whether it's curated playlists or radio stations. Um, certainly radio stations are very important for uh, the non-interactive services. What's interesting is actually, we talk so much in the industry about all of the charts, uh, but fans, when it comes to music discovery, find those to be less important than some of these other features. And finally, um, obviously, if you're a, a new or emerging artist, uh, understanding what's really important in terms of getting noticed by a fan base um, is very important. So we asked some questions around, you know, if you have an artist that you haven't listened to, what is it besides the music that would be very important or inspiring to you um, to give them a listen? And obviously being in the same genre is very important. You know, people like to stick within music that they're familiar with. So that was around 50%. But what I thought was really interesting is that the whole idea of being unique or having your own style or being independent was something that really seemed to resonate, especially with younger people. So if you take a look at the second bar, an artist offering something different compared to other artists, or their image or style, how they dress, the brands that they use. Clearly, social media presence is as important as it's, as it's never been before. 
Um, and then if you go down kind of in the middle there, the fact that they're an independent artist who mostly self-produces their music um, also resonated. Now, obviously a lot of fans don't know whether it's an independent, whether they actually are an independent artist, but I think the whole idea of being independent, being unique, standing for something different, in addition to the music are things that seem to resonate with fans. And as I mentioned, especially younger fans. So these are some of the highlights that we have from the study and I'm going to bring back Richard and Garrett and we can talk a little bit about this. Entirely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Garrett. No, I, I, we were basically saying the same thing, which is it's really fascinating. We could, we could probably spend 45 minutes to an hour just kind of like walking through more slides. <laughs> but I know, uh, you know, it's good for us to talk as well. Richard, like, I, why don't we just start like, like what's like, what jumps out at you? What, when you look at that, you know, kind of given, given where, where you sit in the industry, given your focus within uh, the indie sector, given that it's indie week, as we're talking about this, kind of what jumps out to you as you as you look through what what Russ has just kind of reported out to us? Well, so many things. Um, one thing I think it wasn't really a surprise, but I think that um, it's it's interesting how little charts appear to mean now. They're right at the bottom of that list, and I think um, you know I put that down to the fact that there's so many charts now and. You know, when I was a kid, there was one chart, the top 40, and, and you knew. Um, but also, we were very radio-oriented back then, and, you, you know, you listened to everything on the radio. You kind of were familiar with what was at the top and what was in the top 10 and so on. So that I think that was fascinating to me. Um, the, the, the thing that struck me as interesting was how important the genre of the music was, because my perception is that genre seems to be diminishing. Although thinking about it, I was thinking, well, but if you're a hip hop fan or a country music fan, then, you know, that those are pretty distinct. Although those lines are getting blurred as well these days um, with sort of, you know, very, all the music seemed to be mixing up. So I don't know um, if you had any further insights into that, Russ, or uh, the, the yeah, I, genre. Yes, I, I kind of have a theory on that, that it's it's perhaps it's becoming less about genre in the way that we in the industry define genre, or maybe the classically the way that radio has defined genres and more in the consumer mi consumer's mind that it's kind of consistent with music I'd like to listen to, whether there are, you know, whether there are jazz influences in there, or whether there are hip hop influences there. If it's something, you know, if it's, if it's not dissonant to me, then it's kind of in a genre that I might you know, that, that I might kind of take uh, and accept as my own. Right. I mean, what, what I, for me, genres were really a function of radio and advertising. And uh, there was a period of time when if you didn't fit tightly within a genre, you couldn't get played. I mean, country music was really like that, you know, so you have some sort of substantial country artists that didn't get played on commercial country radio because they didn't fit. And that was true with alternative rock and active rock and, you know, R and B, um, and you 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 couldn't move very far outside, which was a constraint um, for an artist, I think. So I, I personally find this, um, I find the sort of degenerification of the industry um, a relief. Really, it's sort of like artists are free to move in any direction they want. But um, so yeah, I was curious about that. But I think you're probably right. It's probably a sort of more perceptual uh, sense of genre than a than that rigid kind of advertising based sense of genre. Yeah, Russ, one of the things that's really striking to me about, about the findings here, and part of it is, you know, we all come into this with our own biases and our own, our own preferences for how we listen to things as well. But you know, some, of, some of what you unpacked at the, at the outset about, in some ways, reframing how we think about discovery um, as not just about the newest and, and latest, but about reacquainting ourselves with things that we have known for for a long time. Um, you know, I, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about whether and how that has changed over time, and how you think, um, you know, what what you think we can do with that kind of information. What do we What do we do as we think about, um, you know, the catalog as a, as a discovery uh, landscape and not just a, it's not just that my binder of CDs in my closet where I'm like, oh, I want to play something for my sons. I'll go grab, 
you know, the CD that I had forgotten that I had. Right. Well, I, I think, and, and, you know, to be candid with you, I was guilty of it as well through the first couple of, of, of these discovery studies that we did. I, I think, I think historically music discovery has been de defined by, uh, you know, a program director finds something new and gets it into the, the radio playlist. Uh, and that's how we really, really focused on music discovery. But I, I think a, a few years ago, we added to the research, the whole idea of rediscovery, you know, that again, that I hate the term, but the soundtracks of your life thing. And, and kind of surprisingly, what we found is that there were more, really more people interested in rediscovery of music that they, they hadn't heard uh, in a long time than were interested in, you know, new music discovery. So, uh, I, I think part of it is is kind of definitional. You know, for years we just weren't we weren't looking in the right place um, about uh, music rediscovery. I mean, I think the other thing, you know, when when it comes to to that, that's really fascinating is not only the role of streaming, but also the role of all of those. If you go down that long list, you know, whether you're you're rediscovering songs on social media, or we had you know the Fleetwood Mac song blow up, or we've all been locked down with Netflix, and I've been fascinated by the amount of um, movie soundtrack, TV show soundtrack, the amount of sync that I've heard over the last year for catalog music. So, um, you know, to me, it's a massive opportunity to capitalize on catalog, all of these different places where music discovery is occurring. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that slide is fascinating. Just in, in, I mean, there's, you know, 50 or whatever, 35, however many entries there are about places where we discover music, which is like, I know you spend a lot of time thinking about all the different choices that we can present, but it also goes to one of the points I, I raised at the outset, which is we are, there, it, we're our attention, whether it's for, you know, our time spent doing things is drawn in so many different ways. And music is a part of a lot of those things. Um, obviously it's striking to me that, that streaming shows up so so um, so clearly as number one, but it's also striking to me that regardless of where people are discovering that of those like 30 some things, that the next thing that they do is, uh, at, you know, in that, that, that next slide that you showed, or maybe it was the one before it, is they yeah. listen to it more uh, from that person and either more songs, more, uh, that same song again, uh, and that is driven into, into streaming. Can you talk a, a little bit, I mean, I, I'm just fascinated by that kind of how that funnel works there. I know, Richard, this is obviously like of, of great interest to um, <clears throat> the attendees at, 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 at Indie Week of kind of how we like leverage the, all those 30 some ways you can discover, but know that they're gonna end up, most of them are gonna end up their next step on their streaming service, uh, engaging with it again. Yeah, I mean, I, well, that, the actions slide I thought was really fascinating because, um, you know, it's, it, the question is you do hear things on streaming services and then how do you figure out who it is and what it is. So it's interesting to see that people, I mean, I do this myself, but I didn't had no idea if everybody else did. And obviously I'm not in the, in, in the target age range for most, um, most of our labels, but um, uh, it's, I thought that was really a, an interesting, interesting slide, Russ. I didn't have, if you had any further thoughts on that, but I was, I, one thing that seemed like an inconsistency there was, and I've forgotten which slide it was on, but the Shazam, um, uh, use was lower down than um, than than um, listening finding a track in a store or something like that. And I was wondering how people know what it is if they're in a store if they don't shazam it because um, it's not like they announce them or anything. But it seems like people are finding things that way. Yeah, I I, I think without going back to the slide, I don't know if that was also a and you know seeing it and I added the store on iTunes or Amazon, which is interesting given given the, the the state of digital downloads, there's still there's still a reasonable amount of people who are um, finding things on the iTunes platform or on the Amazon you know, download platform when they go into to search for uh, or, or buy a download. I think the Shazam thing is, is, is explained simply. It's it's 
it's simply that you know not everyone has Shazam installed on their on their phone necessarily. So um, it's just a matter of what the installed base is for that particular app compared to some of the um, other alternatives. You know, again, it, it's not a it's not a commentary on on Shazam itself, which I think is a very effective music discovery um, source. It's it's just a commentary on the installed base. Yeah, I, I find sometimes I can't get it open in time. To, <laughs> so find out what the track is I'm listening to. But it's not that big of a gap. It's 26% on um, public places such as stores, clubs, bars, or restaurants. 22% oh, oh. on sh uh, her song ID on something like Shazam. So I, I guess that's within the, within the range of uh, error, right? right? That that was that was really really fascinating to me. Uh, I actually maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was surprised by how many people are happy listening to things they've listened to for years. Um, I mean, and we see that in terms of um, what's happening with catalog sales. Catalog sales are re have really taken off. Um, <clears throat> so I suppose there's nothing too surprising about that. But I, for me, I, I my personal uh, taste is more towards hearing new things. Well, it's interesting, you know, Richard, that you said that, 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 you know, you do, you do research when you, you know, you, you go and you, you know, look people up and stuff and like, so that result spoke to you. I am definitely, I think, uh, I'll, I'll just admit it. I am, I am like far more likely to kind of listen to like be a rediscoverer to like think of, oh, I, you know, I haven't listened to that album for a while and I'm going to listen to that and then see what comes after that. Um, I think you and I are kind of different in, in that way in terms of how we approach kind of listening to things at, at different times but to me that's part of the most fascinating thing about the outcome of this which is it really does um uh illustrate very concretely that there is no single way that people are interacting with the music that they hear or with the services that they are subscribing to um and i think it it, it presents one of the challenges of what do we do next what how do we you know kind of continue to innovate such that we're we're providing those uh tools to people and meeting them where they are but it is it, it i think it's a testament to the fact that that is what is going on right now, right? We're, we're, we're starting to unpack with research like this, finding out where they are, and then we can all collectively learn a little bit more about what do we need to offer to make sure that we continue to meet them there and drive them further towards an experience that works for how they engage with music. Because, I mean, it's always been the case that we've got people who are more passive listeners and we've got people who are incredibly active listeners and the exciting thing to me is that we have the technology and the services and the platforms to be able to meet both groups of those people together where they are in one place and offer like what what is an incredibly compelling experience and that keeps people coming back I mean I, I I'll go back to the to the to the issue that I raised before which is it is remarkable to me you've got these 25 places of discovery I'm, I'm just eyeballing it. And there's probably even more that we're asked about. And what they do next is they go listen to it again on, on streaming. Yeah. I, I, I think clearly the funnel, um, I, again, if I were to compare these results to some of the things that we've done prior, you know, clearly one of the, the large outcomes is how, how firmly established the streaming funnel is. You know, pretty much regardless of where I'm hearing it far and away, the number one thing that I'm doing is kind of, if I'm either going right away to my, my streaming service or I'm making a mental note and going back to my streaming service. Um, and in fact, I think one, you know, one way that, that the streaming services are super serving customers is, you know, if, if you look at the kind of the second thing that they're looking for, which is the name of the song, the lyrics, all of the information you know, clearly the, the streaming services are doing a terrific job in providing the metadata for that. If I go back 10 years ago, consumers would go into Wikipedia to find that kind of information. They'd hear, maybe they'd hear it on the radio, then they were going to Wikipedia. Um, you know, now they're able to stay within the streaming ecosystem and find out a lot of information. And, you know, to your point, Garrett, I, I think what's even interesting is when you go and look at the data, 
you go, oh, well, that artist was in that band. And then you can have, you know, kind of keep on that wheel or cycle of discovery because now you're finding something else about, you know, the artist or, or band that they were in. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's like those huge webs that they, they used to publish in music papers. Um, I'm curious, um, it, it, what, how much of an impact do you think the pandemic has had on these numbers, Russ? I mean, since you've seen numbers over a period of time, if you'd have done this before the pandemic um, uh, or, you know, a year from now, how much, how much different do you think they would be? Um, I, you know, the, for me, the pandemic has made two, two really major changes that we've seen during the pandemic uh, are one, the emergence of live streaming. And even though live streaming wasn't, you know, all that high in terms of the list, it, it, it registered with a number of people. So I, I think, you know, live streaming has really become a, a thing and just, you know, we could do a whole nother panel on that. I think it's, I think it's here to stay for a lot of reasons. Uh, the other thing that we've seen over the last year is social media, you know, especially things like TikTok. Um, I've often said they, over the last year, they've become a music format unto themselves. You know, for years, they were kind of a promotional vehicle for artists. Um, I think increasingly, they're a way that, they're, they're a place that people go and actually, they go to listen to um, and discover music. Um, I suspect some of that may level off post-pandemic. It's, you know, if you're sitting in your cubicle, it's unlikely you'll be watching TikTok for an hour. Let's hope not. Um, but... I do think I do think it's here to stay, um, you know, as, as an actual music format. Yeah, I think I find it fascinating with TikTok is that if you look at any three people in a room's TikToks, they're completely different, right? Yeah, but you know, arguably, we could say, you know, I wonder if their their streaming playlists would be completely different as well. So, yeah, I, would think, I think that's true. Yeah, for sure. Russ, do you want to talk a little bit? You, you, you got on that on that last slide. I think it was. It's the, the the one about kind of what what people are looking for when they discover, and it's got the stuff about kind of um, artist characteristics and traits and what what's driving people towards new music and stuff. Do you want, and, and you mentioned a little bit about like kind of the if you looked at this differently by um, age cohorts and stuff, and, and obviously of, of, of particular interest to, to our audience uh, today, is kind of that, the, the independence of, of the artist. You wanna talk a little bit more about kind of what you saw there and, and right. um, what, how, you know, one of the things that, that we've talked about a little bit is, um, how do we start to really understand what it is that, that drives that consumer behavior? I'm, I'm wondering if even on, on that slide, um, what kinds of further questions you think can be asked um, to start to like hone in on, on these types of, of, you know, this kind of actionable consumer research for, for those of us kind of working in this space and thinking about how we get music in front of people and meet them where they are. You know, one thing, and it's, we, we didn't really go into it in the slides, but I think one thing that, that um, came across to me in the study at, loud and clear was first and foremost, um, the relationship that people create with artists is about the song. Overwhelmingly, we asked a few questions about, is it the artist or is it the song? Um, so I, I think it's really important for everybody to keep in mind, it is, it is fundamentally about the music, first and foremost. Um, the, the, in, in terms of that particular slide, the, the other elements that I thought were really interesting was just the cultural idea of, you know, I want an artist to speak to me. Uh, I want an artist to kind of share the same you know, imagery that's important to me. This may be the same brand acceptance that's important to me. Um, maybe the same views that are important to me. Independence, I think, just generally seems to be something that's important to, to music fans. Um, as I said, I'm, they may not know what an independent artist is, but they like the idea of, of independence. Um, so I, I think there are these elements that we do need to understand a little bit further about what tends to drive the bond between, you know, in addition to the song, what tends to drive the bond between 
uh, a fan and an artist. Um, actually, really interesting, just, you know, the year we've, we've come out of is that, uh, and this is consistent with things we find in a lot of other studies, um, fans don't really want to hear your political views. <laughs> that, that tends to always be at the, the mm -hmm. if there's one piece of advice I could give, keep your politics to yourself. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting about the independence. I mean, that's one of the, the struggles I think the independent sector faces is how do you distinguish yourself as an independent? And I think, um, you know, the Libera Awards, which is happening on Thursday night, the 17th, um, you know, is, is, is a lot about uh, identifying artists as independent because we, we have a lot of independent artists on the Grammys, for instance, but you can't tell there's no identification and I know, I know for me, when, when Sundance first came out, you know, I suddenly realized that all the movies I liked were independent. Well, most of the movies I liked were independent. And so, you know, it's partly my thinking in terms of the Libera was just to say, well, okay, everybody on this show is independent. So if you like this, then that might be a, a good place to look. But um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. It's kind of, I've often wondered if people see it as sort of like, um, organic food or something like that <laughs> um but, but i thought that was that was fascinating and, and it was um it was a lot higher percentage than um caring whether they were signed to a major record label oh. that was kind of encouraging <laughs> uh and i mean as russ as you point out i mean it's not on the slides but right at the end of the day like the, the song is what matters the music is what matters like getting you know a lot of this is all about the 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 the, the strange alchemy of this business that we're in which is how do you how do you actually reach people's emotional responses right. through music and then you know make a business out of that uh, the reason we all have jobs and can continue to like uh, talk about these things is because we're all still trying to figure it out right like we're trying right. to figure out what that what that alchemy is and, and it's funny you know as a researcher i i'm i'm you know I think you could put all the neuroscientists that you wanted in a room to try to, you know, create, use AI to create sort of the, the perfect DNA for an artist and still not get it right. Because, you know, ultimately it's a, it's a bunch of, so, it's a bunch of songwriters sitting in, sitting in a room in Nashville figuring that out. Well, and, and also, I mean, you think about it, right? Like I have favorite artists and they've put out music that I don't like. Right. Like I don't I don't blindly like everything that my favorite artists put out because I'm not I think most of us don't listen to music with a it's not a um, it's it's not an ob objective interaction. It's an entirely subjective interaction. Emotional. Like, yeah, it's entirely emotional. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's uh, it's I, I don't know this this work that that you've done here is fascinating to me that the opportunity to continue to think about these questions and start to to unpack them further is incredibly exciting to me. Um, yeah, I, I know we're kind of running close to the end of time. I can't wait to see kind of like what the next version of this looks like and think about more things that we can <laughs> we can ask and better understand. Yeah, I mean, I think what's going to be interesting in the next next phase is um, creating, out of those different kinds of music discoverers, creating some actual real segments that say, hey, you know, 20% of the population does this and 20% of the population does that. But more importantly, you know, how can Richard's labels um, or, or the DSPs that you represent, Garrett, actually go and, and target, not only target in a proactive way, but also support those different kinds of fan behaviors. So I think that's going to be a, a really interesting next step in the genesis of the project. Yeah, I mean, look, it got, it, in a lot of ways, it goes back to, to what I was saying before, which is this is about meeting people where they are, but you have to know where they are first. And I, I do think, and I think that the, I know that the services are proud of this, that the innovations that they've undertaken to kind of be everything to everyone in terms of that, that um, really seamless and integrated music experience, but what your everything is, what Richard's everything is, what my everything is, could be very different. And I think this kind of research really helps all of us understand a little bit better what those different, you know, buckets of things that that, that the fans out there are looking for, how to how what what falls in them, and how to fill them, and, and kind of get get what they want in front of them. 
Yeah, I mean, to me, that was the, the great thing about streaming when it first started, and I've been on streaming services since the very, the very beginning, um, is, is not that there's, it's not that you're going to listen to everything because nobody could listen to everything, but it's that you can find pretty much everything that you want to find. And that was not so easy in the physical world. And it was more expensive too. I mean, yeah. you know, I would walk out of Tower Records with hundreds and hundreds of dollars of CDs. And then you have um, to find a place to put them in your, <laughs> in your, in your apartment or your house. Right. You know, so right. it's, uh, it's, uh, these breaking down these barriers, adding this unlimited shelf space. These are all really exciting things. Um, yeah. so, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone has any further closing thoughts. This has been really fascinating to me. Uh, it's been great to, to work with you on this Russ, and, and see what you've, That's you've come so. up with here. Um, and, uh, you know, Richard, always, always a pleasure talking to you about this kind of stuff. And thanks for, thanks for having us here to, to, to chat about this, this topic. We could have, I think we could have gone for a couple hours, just like going slide by slide and line by line and, and, and trying to, to unpack it further. I'm completely intrigued by it. I mean, apart from anything else, I'm intrigued to compare it to just my own behavior, but um, thank you, Garrett, you know, for, you know, for, for coming up with this idea and um, thank you, Russ, for, doing the research um it's it's amazing i can't wait to see the whole the whole thing but um i think it's incredibly useful to help us understand how people behave and also i'd love to compare this uh, i don't know how often you do this kind of thing but um it'd be really interesting to look at it say a year or so from now yeah well Maybe maybe we'll be maybe we'll be able to do this in person we'll next be, year and, and uh, we'll be back. Back next iteration. <laughs> exactly. Stay tuned. Stay tuned in for per, more. In person, I hope. In I person. hope so. I hope so. Thank you all so right. much. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye.